so yeah, instrumenting the world with the beam. Um, so we're on Rosetta Home 2.0. So uh, that is the name of the, the project. Um, it's actually an organization on GitHub as well. Um, yeah, and you may have noticed that uh, little short-ish URL uh, for Google up there. Um, it's kind of nice. You can, I've, I've used it a couple times before. Sometimes I get feedback, sometimes I don't. Um, but rather than you know, holding your questions to the end and maybe forgetting, you can just ask them as we go. I get a little display up here of the questions that are popping up. At the end, I can actually show them up on the screen, so they're in the video. Um, it works really well if you guys want to participate. So it's a good way to do it. We'll do, you know, if you want to ask the question out loud, uh, we'll do that as well at the end, so if we have time. Um, so yeah, he gave a pretty good background on CRT Labs. Um, here's the GitHub, uh, our blog, crtlabs.org. Um, NAR, we've got our own uh, top level domain now, .realtor. Um, I don't want to get into that, um, but uh, that's you know, the Realtor site. Uh, our Twitter handle, CRT Labs, and my Twitter handle, uh, Entropy Lab. Um, so feel free to check that stuff out. Um, the GitHub is pretty updated. Um, I haven't done much documentation in the code, unfortunately, but um, there's all, all sorts of stuff on getting this stuff up and running. Um, I've actually got a firmware image you can just download. Um, so feel free to check that stuff out as well. Um, so what is, what is instrumenting the... Oh no, it's closed. Oh, maybe I should turn it on. That might help. <laughs> Refresh. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, I would like that to work. Um, usually, you know what? Let me, let me refresh this. Oh. I don't have internet. Um, fantastic. <laughs> Let's try connecting to a hidden network and see if that works. <laughs> Linux and Wi-Fi, right? It works every time. <laughs> every time, half the time. Forty percent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. Is this, is this Ethernet live? Do we know? Oh my gosh. Now I've lost control of my slides as well. <laughs> uh, let me, oh, the URL went away. Okay, so maybe, maybe it's coming through now. Okay. Where's my mouse? Over here. And let me start presenting again. All set up, ready to go. Okay, full screen. Let me get this. Uh, continue recent. Can we try that URL? It's probably a different URL now. No, no, that's closed. Oh, hold on, hold on, okay. Google. Okay, URL's up there, should be good. I guess you know my slides before we went to talk about them. We're in? Okay, thanks Brian. <laughs> no, it's just, just okay. So, what does instrumenting the beam mean, or instrumenting the world with the beam mean, right? 
Um, so we're really interested in, and me personally as well, in the built environment, right? So buildings like this, your home, commercial buildings, hotels, whatever they are. Um, and looking at what makes a healthful building. Now that means the health of the air, but also how efficient is that building? How, you know, is it healthy in the sense that its systems work well, right? Um, so to do that, we're looking at hyperlocal weather. We actually install weather stations on the building, um, energy usage, um, so we can talk to smart meters, we can put stuff directly into the electrical panels to get real-time information on the energy usage. Um, HVAC utilization, there's a few um, thermostats that we can talk to. Uh, some are cloud-based, some actually have a local API over the local LAN. Um, so we can talk to thermostats to get the HVAC utilization. Um, indoor environmental quality, um, we've actually built our own sensors, which you can see here. This has about 16 different sensors on it. Uh, I'll get, there's a whole breakdown over here, uh, but we're building these, so we're monitoring indoor environmental quality. Um, part of it's kind of started as an automation, a home automation system, so we actually have some support for media devices like Chromecast um, and some Wi-Fi enabled light bulbs, uh, specifically LifeX. Um, Basically, all of these I've written drivers for, um, and they're all open source as well. So even if you don't want to use this overall project, um, feel free to check out the core libraries for LifeX or Zigbee Smart Energy. Um, in your environmental quality, you'll have to get a toaster oven and um, <laughs> uh, pick and place your own boards to do that. That's what we do in the lab right now. It's actually a toaster oven that uh, makes the stuff. Um, but yeah, so feel free to check that stuff out. Um, but that's, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the health of a building, instrumenting the world, uh, the built world specifically. But we, also, we can also do outdoor, uh, outdoor environmental quality as well. Um, the, the end goal of this is homeostatic buildings, right? Buildings that achieve a balance, um, a healthful balance. Um, there's a couple standards out there. Uh, in Germany, there's one called Passive House, uh, which is really, really impressive. Um, and they're looking at um, using as little technology as possible, actually, in built in, building with the built environment, um, using uh, passive solar and different things like that. Really cool. And, and LEED uh, here in the States, which is eh, okay, um, but it's, you know, it is kind of the standard around here. Um, these are great when you're building new, right? But 99% of the buildings, and 99% of the buildings that uh, realtors are transacting with um, our existing homes or existing buildings, right? So we got to do something about that. Um, really great guy, um, Malcolm Wells, he passed away about two years ago, unfortunately, um, had this big movement on earth homes and earth cities, right? And building infrastructure to, to work with the built environment. Um, this, this kind of building here in the background is actually one of his drawings. Um, I think, that, I think personally, I think they're absolutely gorgeous. Um, would love to build one one day. Um, one of, the, one of the newer ones in the Netherlands is called The Edge, and this is uh, Deloitte Consulting. Uh, they're building, I, I forget the architecture firm, but this is kind of the cutting edge of smart buildings, right? Um, it's monitoring everything in real time and adapting. Um, very, very tech heavy, right? Um, kind of the opposite, opposite of something like Passive House, uh, but achieving, achieving similar results. And like I mentioned, um, so these are all great when you're building new, but 99% of the homes and buildings are existing. So what are we, you know, what are we going to do? Um, and you know, the question I get all the time: seriously, realtors, or what, what, what are you doing in IoT and Elixir and embedded devices? Um, and it's, it's it's kind of an interesting story, right? We're uh, we're so we're a nonprofit, we're a trade organization, uh, 1.2 million members, so actually the largest trade association in the U.S. Um, nonprofit. Um, we see anywhere from 80 to 90% of all, so there's real estate agents and there's realtors, right? Uh, I, I wanna say it's 70, maybe even higher, 70% of real estate agents are realtors. So they pay dues probably to their local association um, and up to the national association. Um, we see, you know, we do commercial and residential. Um, you know. I, the way I sell it to the realtors as well is a healthy building is back on the market and sells faster, right? So if, if you imagine the housing stock as, as our inventory, the faster they can move a home, the more money they make. And they're generally concerned about that commission, right? So if we can ensure and have data on the health of that building, we can get it to move faster. If we know the energy usage, that stuff, um, it, it helps them. Um, one of my goals is to make the built environment better, right? So if we can, if we can create a massive data set of real data um, on how these homes perform, right? Drywall versus cob in the Southwest or the Northwest. Um, and look at all these different building materials, you know, what a home is built with. 
Um, we can start doing some pretty interesting machine learning on that, uh, but maybe even license that data, right? So we got to get that non-dues non revenue sometimes. Um, so there's, there's some different assets there. Um, meaningful change in, in home health long term, right? So, you know, this is, it's not going to be quick to do this, um, but we, we want to improve quality of life um, for, for these people. Um, and Rosetta Home itself is a research platform. So it's not just a project, it's actually more of a platform. Um, we're working, we've got some projects that they just want energy, we've got some projects where they want the whole, the whole shebang. Um, and so we've built this to be easy to configure and quickly deploy new projects for different, different initiatives. Um, and like I said, got to get that non-dues revenue sometimes. Um, so, um, but that's, that's how we are funded, is through the dues of our members, um, and then CRT and CRT Labs uh, get a budget out of that. Um, this is our cool little lab here. Um, <clears throat> it's very small, 612 square feet, five of us in there, sometimes six or seven or eight. Um, got a little telepresence robot over there. Um, you know, we're not just working on this, we're actually looking at the future of real estate, right? Um, so, that's, so we've got blockchain projects, we've got this. Um, we do a lot of education for our membership on what smart homes mean, how do you, how do you transfer the ownership of you know, a nest thermostat so that the previous owner doesn't have control of that. Um, we got some fun little quotes, science-y quotes on the side there. And our door, which you can't really see, is a pretty great quote. And this is um, the National Association of Realtors, um, uh, 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 oh geez, forgetting the word. Um, I forget, but it's the beginning of their, of, of um, what, what they live by, right? I, I, a mission statement, essentially, right? Um, so I've, I've kind of, uh, I, I kind of want to read this. Um, Under all is the land. Upon its wise utilization and widely allocated ownership depend the survival and growth of free institutions and of our civilization. Realtors should recognize that the interests of the nation and its citizens require the highest and best use of the land and the widest distribution of land ownership. They require the creation of adequate housing, the building of functioning cities, the development of productive industries and farms, and the preservation of a healthful environment. And honestly, you know, when, when realtors kind of reached out to me uh, uh, about this position, it was really up in the air until I read this. And then once I read this and saw this is kind of what, you know, the really good realtors, this is what drives them, right? And they, and they really understand that. There's other ones that are out there just to, you know, make a buck and make a commission. But um, this, this really drove home for me, um, especially that last part. Um, and it, it really drives what this research platform is all about. Uh, a little bit of backstory on Rosetta Home 2.0, right? Um, so we had Rosetta Home 1.0, and actually, if any of you were here last year, my boss actually presented on that. Um, this was a Python-based system, all in the cloud. We'd actually like ping into APIs and clouds and, and some local devices through router backdoors and stuff like that um, to, to kind of collect all this information. Um, Cool system. This is a fun little visualization of our AMQP uh, uh, buckets and stuff. And the, on the far left are the homes, the different types of the devices, um, all the values they create, and then the different, uh, different ways to, to connect that stuff. Um, what we started doing, we started looking at the market around indoor environmental quality. Um, right now, there's quite a few devices out there, consumer, consumer grade devices, that you can get for about two, $250, right? And you get one. Um, we want to be able to instrument a whole home um, for about that same price, $200, $250, uh, which is where this guy came in. Um, so we've been developing our own little board here. Um, the issue with that is, you know, we're not, we're not putting Wi-Fi on that. That's not going to connect directly to the internet. So we need, we need a gateway of some sort, right? And so this is, that's kind of how the, the idea of taking Rosetta Home 1.0 and making embedded gateways to, to kind of push this data up to the cloud um, got started. Um, my own personal thing, I wanted, I actually didn't want to connect to the internet. I want to be able to have this information, but I wanted to have automation that did not rely on the internet. No cloud, no security, you know, make that attack vector as small as possible. You'd have to have physical access to the network to control my lights or my heater or, or anything like that. Um, so a land-based automation system, not cloud, nothing like that. Um, and it's still, right now we do push data up just for research and, and analytics, um, but it does totally work without internet. And I'll, I'll show you a little demo of that. Um, Zero configuration. I want to plop this device in, set up the internet, and then have it discover everything. And we do that. Um, the weather stations, all that stuff, zero configuration. Um, you, can, you can control your thermostat and configure that, but um, that's just a little slider, right? So really simple. Um, and why Elixir Nerve? So he mentioned, you know, I came to the conference last year. 
I knew about Erlang. Um, I was pretty excited about it, but never really had dove into it. Um, came to the conference last year, fell in love with you guys, really. The community was amazing. Um, saw so many great talks. And I was talking to somebody in the lunch line, and, uh, like and we had started talking about making this embedded gateway. And so he was like, oh, you should check out Nerves. And I was like, oh, OK. And then I, I don't know who that was. I, it was just some random person. Um, went home, checked out Nerves, and I was like, holy shit, OK. Let's do this. Um, but it's, it's extremely efficient as well, right? I'm using about 5% CPU, 10% of memory on a Raspberry Pi. Right? Raspberry Pi is a pretty powerful little guy. So um, it's, it's a great platform. Ner Elixir Nerves is perfect for this. Um, so we, you know, we've got all these different subsystems. You know, we're talking to weather stations, all this different stuff. Um, so these are all the, the protocols we currently support within, um, within the Rosetta platform. Um, so through some different dongles like USB sticks, uh, we've got so 915 megahertz uh, frequency shift keying. So that's actually what this guy communicates over. Um, the weather stations also use that same frequency. Zigbee SE. So Zigbee has a couple different profiles. Uh, smart Home is one. Um, and Smart Energy is another. And so we're using the Smart Energy to talk to smart meters. Uh, I know California is pretty much completely deployed. Uh, Illinois is very, Chicago is totally deployed. Um, but not just electric meters, we can actually talk to gas meters and water meters as well if, they're, if they support the Zigbee Smart Energy Protocol. Um, MDNS for local device discovery uh, on your local network. Uh, SSDP for similar um, but less fun experience. Um, UART, uh, so you know, just kind of serial over the USB uh, interface there. And then a, a, currently one custom, which, which is LifeX, which is a binary UDP protocol uh, for Wi-Fi light bulbs. Um, actually extremely efficient. Um, Little buggy, but um, uh, we've got the, the core library for that that's open source as well. So if you want to have some fun with lights, that's a cool one. Uh, so Rosetta Home, uh, what is it? Well, it's built on the shoulders of giants, right? I mean, there, there's no way any of this would be possible without the work of probably millions of man hours uh, before me. Um, and if we look very down at the bottom, uh, we've got a Linux kernel, right? Um, on top of that, well, BusyBox kind of creates that with the help of build root. Um, we got Nerves, which is, you know, kind of handling all this. Elixir sits there. Um, and then we've got these Elixir libraries. So basically, after BusyBox, everything up is Elixir. We're, we're, in, we're in the beam uh, at this point. So we've got Nerves Network Interface, um, WPA Supplicant, which is actually going to call out to the WPA. Uh, is it a port that it's using for that? Yeah. Um, to talk to WPA on the Linux, uh, Linux world. Um, interim Wi-Fi, which is wrapping that up, and Nerves UART. Um, there's probably a few other libraries that I'm using that I totally missed here. So this is, this is pretty high level. Um, so that's Nerves, right? Um, Cicada, oh, Cicada is um, what's making all of this very easy. So Rosetta Home is essentially just the configuration, but Rosetta, uh, Cicada sits on top of Nerves and kind of uh, abstracts this even a little bit more. So we get a network manager, um, and I'll go through the details of kind of each of these uh, areas as well. Device manager, distribution manager, uh, system monitor, an event manager layer, which is how our APIs, and we actually have voice control as well, totally local voice control, no cloud required. Um, it's on hold right now. I, I, have it, I have it working, but it's uh, not part of my initial or my current implementation, so I've taken it out. Um, so WebSockets REST. And then, like I said, Rosetta Home is, is kind of that, the customized version of that. So per deployment, um, you know, we can tell it what plugins to use, right? Do we want light bulbs or do we just want energy? Do we want uh, weather stations or, you know, whatever that is? Uh, we get a cloud interface. And again, cloud interface could be different per deployment, right? We might have a different cloud. We might be talking to somebody else's servers. Um, and the UI might be totally different depending on what kind of uh, view they want from that local, the local LAN. Um, so, very high level, um, and Justin, thank you so much for all your work on nerves, making all this all possible, um, and all the Linux people in the world. Um, so, indoor environmental quality. Um, CO2, so this, this little board, you will not believe it, has all of these sensors. Uh, CO2, temperature, humidity, VOC, uh, actually, okay, so I lie. Uh, PM2.5 is a separate module that uses the same radio frequency, so it's actually a separate, separate thing. Requires quite a bit more power, it's big. Um, not everybody needs the PM2.5. PM um, that's particulate matter that's very small that can actually get into your bloodstream, um, but also very, very bad for asthmatics and, and different people. 
um, UV, uh, UV slash lux, so light levels, uh, sound levels, um, NO, NO2, which isn't listed here, a few, and a few other ones. Um, so it's, it's a pretty impressive little board. Um, we've got an architectural engineering student who's, his PhD is about kind of doing some of this instrumentation. So he's been driving the work on this, this little guy. Um, like I said, it's FSK, um, 915 megahertz or 433. Um, the interface, so that talks to the radio gateway, right? So we've got a, we've got a little gateway here that is the receiver of this. Um, kind of does, it does 128-bit encryption, um, PKI, um, so it's somewhat secure. Uh, not, not great, but it's, you can't control anything. It's just sending temperature data, right? So we're not too worried about it, but we, we've, we've protected it as much as the radio system allows. Um, ask you if you are, and this is pinging uh, the gateway every six seconds. So we'll see this little green light light up. Uh, there it goes. Um, and so that means it's sending data, right? And then actually there's a little LED on the radio board that means it received the data. Um, so that's, that's our indoor environmental quality sensor. Uh, Hyperlocal weather. Uh, I was going to bring a whole kit, um, and I decided that's just a lot of work and an extra cost and baggage and all this different stuff. And my, I thought my slides were good enough, you know. So, um, so we're using uh, ambient weather sensor array. Uh, it's ambient weather here in the states. Um, it's actually made by a company called Fine Offset. Um, so you can buy these. They're hundred dollars, ninety nine dollars on Amazon. Actually, um, we get. Rainfall, wind speed, wind gust, wind direction, solar radiation, UV, temperature, humidity, and pressure. Um, and then actually the Meteo stick, which again, this is 915 megahertz. This is an expensive little guy because uh, he's reverse engineered the protocol. It's not an open protocol. He's reverse engineered it. Um, this has pressure and indoor temperature on it as well. Um, and that's, again, just going to plug into uh, our thing here. Oh, I guess I didn't... Oh, I haven't, I haven't posted it yet. Okay, never mind. Um, and so this pings us every 16 seconds with weather data. So we've got pretty good resolution on, on weather data. Um, and again, that's ASCII over UART. It's doing similar things. It's decrypting the key. He somehow figured out what the encryption key is through I don't know what method, but um, I'm not a radio engineer or very good at reverse engineering that stuff, but he did, um, and it's awesome, but kind of expensive. So we're, we're actually trying to reverse engineer his so that we can, because uh, the, the radio board is like $7, right? So like if we, could, if we could just figure out this protocol, we could have these boards extremely cheap and maybe even use the same gateway and have it just hop between the two. Um, but as we, as we you know, deploy like 50 of these sensors, which we have quite a few in the lab, um, you start looking at drop packets and stuff like that. So we'd probably do two boards. Uh, energy usage. Um, so this is the Zigbee Smart Energy. We're using uh, a system called from uh, Rainforest Automation. Uh, this is the Raven uh, USB stick. This is only available to commercial customers, um, but is the exact same chipset as their consumer market one, um, which is called the Eagle Gateway, and it operates more as a home automation system. Um, but then has a Zigbee chipset to talk to. Well, so they've got they they implement both profiles. They implement Smart Energy and Smart Home, so they can talk to light bulbs and stuff like that too. Uh, this is XML over UART. Not fun, um, but, and this pings us with uh, data from our smart meter every eight seconds. Um, few alternatives to this, right, if you don't have a smart meter, we can actually uh, install something like Nurio here directly into your electrical panel. Um, this has got a little local API. This updates every millisecond, so it'd be up to us how often we want to pull that endpoint. It's not spitting out the data, but we can go pull that endpoint um, on that little, little computer uh, there and get some really, really accurate data. Um, HVAC utilization. Uh, so currently, the one that the only one I found that offers a local, or like I said, I, I wanted a cloud-free internet, no internet required system. The only thermostat right now that offers a local API is Radio Thermostat. Now the API is offered on a USNAP device, which is a kind of industrial standard for networking connectivity. Um, it might even be more than just networking connectivity. Um, so they've got a nice little API. Um, it uses a, a variant of SSDP um, from a company called Marvel. Um, very, very similar, just kind of slightly different header names. I have no idea why they did that. But um, and this, we have to poll every 10 seconds to get the, the well, we, we poll every 10 seconds. We could probably do it less. Um, but this gives us the status, right? What it thinks the temperature is, what its set points are, um, is the fan on, you know, what, it current, what its current status is. And then obviously, you know, you've got your Nest, your Ecobees, Honeywell, Emerson. None of these offer local control. Um, you all have to go up to the cloud and do, again, that zero configuration. You'd have to OAuth to their servers, and it would have to be the account owner, and you know, it's just kind of a pain in the ass. So um, 
we're, we're keeping it simple. That's, that's the goal. Uh, lighting. Um, so again, it, it started as kind of maybe a home automation system um, that quickly kind of folded and said, oh, let's just make this a research platform because um, home automation is hard. Handling all these different devices is tricky. Um, so we, we still like the idea of lights, but more as just indicators, right? Especially these Wi-Fi lights. Like if you, if you plug in a light to up there, um, people have been so trained to swoop off a light switch, right? Well, that kills the Wi-Fi. You, you don't have control of your, of your light bulb anymore. It's like, well, that's fucking stupid. Why? So I, I'm not a huge fan of connected light bulbs um, in that, for that reason. Um, but I think like in a lamp or in, a special, in, a, in the right spot, it acts as a really good indicator of, right, if you want to know about air quality, right, you can indicate that through brightness, color, different things, energy usage. You can do a lot of different things with that. So it, it's, it's valuable, but not, I don't, the way they sell them, I think it's probably, I, I, don't, I don't really like it. Um, obviously, alternatives, Hue, something like that, that's Zigbee. Uh, again, you can do local control, but configuration is tricky. You got to go like trick the board and do all these different things. Um, Media players, we do support media players. Um, again, this kind of started as the, as the, uh, the home automation platform, um, but I wrote a really great Chromecast library, so if you want to control your Chromecast from Elixir, you can do it. Um, so we have Chromecast, this is MDNS, this is protobuffers over an SSL connection, um, and the pings vary depending on, you know, it kind of backs off when it hasn't been active for very long, but you do get the, the background images so you can, you know, pull it up and see what's playing or how long you've been playing, different stuff. Obviously, there's alternatives, Apple TV, Roku, um, just a UPnP player, something like that, that would be, you could actually control over the local network as well. Um, so what, what makes this a platform and not just like a fun little toy project, right? Um, well, we've gone, I've gone through and uh, really tried to, to, you know, abstract everything out into uh, what, you know, what a home might have or even a commercial building, right? So we've created these device classes. Um, they're implemented as behaviors. That's probably pretty small. I'll pull up the code if we have time uh, to go through. Um, but we have a, different types of device classes, right? Um, and they all implement a, a behavior and different callbacks. So if you're going to implement something like a uh, media player, we well, need to be able to play. You need to be able to pause. You want to know the current time, right? Um, so there's, there's just a certain number of functions that you must implement. Um, so we've got IEQ, indoor environmental quality, media player, HVAC, light, camera, smart meter, and a weather station. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's just some of the code. Those are the, those are the actual behaviors there. They all derive from uh, a, a, the core device and then on top of that, which has uh, some, some implementation things there. You should, you, if, you, if you ever implement a device, you would never have to deal with the actual low-level device stuff. Um, so um, I, I wasn't really aware of this. You know, I'm pretty new to Elixir, but I didn't know you couldn't pattern match and function heads on maps until recently. I use that everywhere. It is amazing. So what we're doing here is um, the device manner. So a device state, right, is represented with this little uh, struct here, um, or map, I guess. Uh, it's the way, the way Elixir does the, the, the module with the def struct is kind of interesting, but um, it's efficient. Um, you can see we derive from the poison encoder. Um, we noticed a few issues with JSON encoding when we were sending over the WebSocket. Um, once we got enough people connected to the local interface and it was sending a lot of messages, it was slow. So um, using this derive, um, I'm guessing it's some kind of compiler um, uh, efficiency that here that um, helps it, helps it uh, compile or serialize the JSON as it's kind of coming out of the stream. Um, so you, you get the module. Actually, module isn't really used anymore, so that's kind of a standover for, or stay over from older stuff. But you know the type, right? That's the device class. Um, the device PID, so usually what we're going to have is, you know, you've got your core library, your LifeX library, whatever it is, that's running, it finds, it gets a device, does all that stuff, you get an event into Cicada, and you're going to generate your interface PID, which is the one that implements the, the actual callbacks for the device class. Um, so in there is the device PID, which is the original, you know, whatever library you're using is the PID of that original device, and then we've got the PID of the interface, which is the one that our Cicada system knows how to work with, right? Um, uh, the name, right, so whatever name you've given that device or the system has given that device, and the, the, the device class state, so the specific state of that device, which is coming from LifeX or Chromecast or the Weather Station uh, library. Um, 
So here's, here's a couple different ones for your different implementations of the device class state. Again, really small, I'm sorry about that. We've got a smart meter, which is gonna have your connection status, uh, the channel that it's connected on for the Zigbee protocol, uh, the MAC ID of the meter, signal strength, uh, the type, whether it's gas, electric, water, um, the current price of whatever you're moving. And here it's called kilowatt and kilowatt delivered and received. Um, that should just be delivered, received, and current, because if it's not an electric meter, obviously kilowatts don't make sense. Um, so that's gonna change. Uh, weather station, similar thing, we've got you know, the state that you, that you want. And so the idea with these is, as you're implementing a device, um, you're going to, these are the states that Cicada recognizes, right? So if you're gonna implement a weather station, it doesn't matter what weather station is, it doesn't even matter what the core library represents its state as. Um, as long as you're able, you, there's, there's a method that gets called update state that passes whatever state was given to you by that device. You just need to manipulate that state to return this. And as long as you do that, everything works. Your front ends will work. You can control it. We, we can log it. We can send it to the cloud. Um, and everything's fantastic. Uh, and there's an HVAC one there. Um, so yeah, so device implementation. Um, so first, you know, figure out what kind of device class you want. Um, actually, implementing new device classes is as simple as just saying this is the behavior, right? And defining what kind of state you want it to look like and then giving it some callback functions for whatever it is. So adding new device classes is really easy. Um, do you want it to store its data and create histograms and give you a nice little short history within, with, on the local device? So you just have to decide that. That's just using a use command in Elixir to, uh, to not inherit, but um, you know, to, to get on that, that uh, functionality. And then the callbacks, right? So whatever the device type is, we, you, you're gonna choose the behavior type, you're gonna use that as your behavior, and then you just have to go through and implement your, your callbacks. Um, but also, you know, how do you, where do you find this device? Where, you know, once you're on the network, what do you do? So you, you, there's a discovery mechanism, mechanism right now. Um, right now, these are the supported ones, MUNS, SSDP, UART, custom, you know, LifeX is the custom one. Um, you know, maybe OAuth could be one, right, where you're going out and you're gonna OAuth to a server. That could be a discovery method as well. Um, that's not implemented because I want to keep it local and simple. Um, but that's the idea. So you're going to implement the discovery method for that device as well. This is LifeX. Um, so this is a lot of code. Again, this is probably small. Pull it up on the, uh, the editor. Actually, let me just do that now. Um, yeah, so this is LifeX here. Oh, you don't see that. Um, so, yeah, so we've given the behavior of uh, a light. Um, we've aliased our device manager and our voice control. That's uh, a gen server. We're gonna start link. Um, so here's our, right, here's our API. Um, these are basically our callbacks that we have to implement um, for it to work. So we can sit, for a light, we can set the color. We can turn on, off, color, hue, saturation, uh, brightness, the Kelvin, uh, which is the color, uh, color temperature. Um, device is one. So this is basically calling device just returns the device state. Um, Update state uh, there, get ID. So this is essentially the, the PID ID of, uh, of the interface ID. So here's map state, right? So it, it gets the state, it knows what that is from LifeX. Um, and then we map it to our device manager at device.light.state, which is what Cicada knows about. Um, and just return that. Um, in it, um, voice control. So that's kind of the fun stuff. I'll go down to the discovery. Um, so here we've got discovery. Um, we are going to alias a few things. Um, we've got, so life, a lot of the earlier libraries are using gen event, um, just because that was kind of what was available when I wrote all these libraries. Um, could use registry or gen stage or something like that now, but um, it works. It works well. And we're not, we're not doing, you know, it's not huge volume. You know, you get this device every two or three seconds. So it's, it, speed isn't really an issue. Um, gen event works fine. Um, so we're going to have an event handler here. Um, register callbacks you have to implement. So we're going to we're going to network manager, which is part of Cicada. Um, we're going to register to its event stream, which is actually using registry. So Cicada is all registry based. A lot of the older libraries are event gen event based. Um, and this is also also an old pattern matching here. Don't now you can just do um, handle info network interface. Is it bound? Right, bound true. Cool. Um, we're going to start the LifeX client once we're bound to the internet. Um, if any of you saw Justin's talk, you have to bring all your, you know, you can't just expect Wi-Fi or internet to be up. You have to bring it all up, and you're going to wait for your events to start happening, and, and then, so once we're up, um, we're going to start our LifeX client. Um, 
we add our handler to the LifeX client here, event handler. Um, that is going to call this handle info in return. And basically, all you have to do once you do discovery is just say, handle device, and you just send it. And you tell it, obviously, tell it what type of device to handle. But handle device is, um, is part of, so you'll see here we use um, discovery, right? And so discovery is just this, this uh, low level um, gen server, essentially, um, that will handle all of this stuff for you. So you just say, handle, handle event. And it says, okay, have I ever seen this event? Have I seen this device before? If not, call get ID, spawn the thing. If so, just push the events through, update its manipulated state, and broadcast. And so then like your API and WebSockets can listen to it, you can see it. Um, data manager can, can get the data, collect it into the histogram, so that when Cloud Logger every 10, 15 minutes, or every minute, whatever you want to do, can go to the histogram, get the data, and push it up. Um, Okay, five minutes, oh my god, okay. Um, all right, that's that, so network manager. Um, we also go into AP mode. Um, network manager can manage AP mode, ethernet, Wi-Fi. It also gives us the board ID, which is the MAC address of the ethernet port, or uh, the actual board ID, which is uh, a NERVS uh, thing, and obviously the IP address, the current IP address. Histogram, we're storing data. Um, again, you can, do the, you can use this if you want or not. All the current plugins currently do. Um, this is obviously the, the, the observer uh, uh, stack here. Um, the rave histogram, the first one is a, is a supervisor. These are all little gen servers keeping state and will return like a histogram of the, the current values you've seen since you last called snapshot. So calling snapshot on histogram uh, will give you all the histogram data and then, and then clear it. Um, could probably implement like rolling windows or something like that as well, but it's, again, it's very simple right now. Uh, API, this gives us REST interface. This is an example of our little local, uh, local website. Oops, sorry. Uh, REST, WebSocket, uh, and metric history. Again, calling back into that histogram data. Uh, UI, this current UI, um, which comes in the default firmware, and we'll show you all this stuff, is Elm, uh, Elm-based. Uh, it's WebSockets, it's mobile first, and it's only available on the LAN, right? It's only, you know, it's not attached to the internet anywhere. Um, here's an example of the thermostat interface. Controlling the light bulb, we can set color, turn it on and off. Um, the metric history again. Uh, cloud interface, so we're at home right now. Uh, it's pushing over a, 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 an encrypted MQTT uh, to InfluxDB. Uh, I'm going to skip this. InfluxDB is a time series database. Uh, it's great, um, although I know Br me and Brian talked about it last year. Um, he's got some other thoughts on it. I, I really like it. I haven't used it at the scale that Brian was working at at that time. It, it has gotten better. It's, they've got a 1.0 release now, um, and it is good. But I was never, I've was i never worked at the scale that Brian was working at, so I'm sure he's, <laughs> he's got other stuff. Um, it's cool. Um, you create retention policies. Um, so you get your real time, which is just all the data moving in. Um, we can we then roll that up to uh, store everything for 15 minutes. So real time, we store it for 30 days. Uh, so this is nice when you're, you're dealing with all this data. And you just don't want like, exponential growth. Um, you can create these retention policies. Every 15 minutes, we roll up the real-time data. We keep that for a year. And then we uh, roll up the 15-minute data into one-hour increments, and we keep that forever. So we've got all for, as, long as, you know, as long as it doesn't get erased, um, you've got one-hour resolution for all this data for, forever. These are the continuous queries that, that push data into those, uh, into those retention groups. These are some, this is some example queries of InfluxDB. So this is, right, so we, this is how we map that state into... Uh, a measurement point in InfluxDB. And so, again, knowing what that state is going to look like um, makes this very easy, and we can just keep it very, very simple. Um, it's kind of awesome. Um, this is an example of what it looks like. Um, so this is the back end. This is called Brood, right? If anybody was hanging out with me last night, we went into this. Um, it's templatized dashboard in Grafana. Um, so you get your different nodes up on top here. We've got kilowatt usage, heat map of your kilowatt usage. That's that minute granularity. Uh, what the status of the, the, uh, the, the uh, smart meter has been, whether you're connected or disconnected. IEQ, we're showing CO2, CO, VOC, temperature, humidity, rainfall. Um, I don't have the, the, the thermostat hooked up. So this is all data from my house. Um, I don't have the thermostat hooked up yet. And then like the signal of the LifeX bulb and what the current status of the Chromecast has been. Um, near term, uh, I really want to get into releases of Cicada. Um, Modbus support for commercial would be fantastic. Um, Barrel DB maybe for, for some of the local storage here. Uh, Multi-node, so distributed Erlang for large commercial buildings would be great. Um, adding more devices, um, 
scenes, so you can kind of start doing a little bit of that automation stuff, um, and alerting, obviously. Um, and goal, I mentioned, creating this massive research data set, uh, multiple building styles in each climate zone, multiple family types, um, create a research data set, and I'd really like to see a strong community around um, people utilizing uh, this platform. So thank you, and I did get some questions. Um, awesome job on fixing that, that's fantastic, thank you. Um, let's present this. Okay, how are you detecting recognizing voice commands without a cloud API, and what kind of recognition actually do you get? Uh, recognition is pretty good. It's called Movi, M-O-V-I. Uh, it's from a company called Automy. Um, it's actually an Arduino shield, but you can hook it directly up to a Raspberry Pi as well pretty easily over the serial ports. Um, very cool. Um, so we had a little ARM Cortex. It's kind of expensive. It's like 80 bucks, um, but it's, it's very tweakable and, and really, really fun. Um, how many boards... Oh, present. Um, how many boards per house, one per room? So, yeah, we want to do one of these, but this board... Um, one per house at minimum. We'd like north, south, east, west of the house so we can look at solar radiation and how the home reacts. Um, and then ideally kind of automate that stuff too. So, and looking at historical data, we can say, well, it's about three degrees colder than you usually like it, but in 20 minutes, this, you know, this side of the house really heats up. Let's wait, you know, let's wait 20 minutes and then we can, you know, so you're saving energy, doing all that stuff. Um, can your sensor kit run off battery? If so, how long can it run? Uh, yes, um, and, and my, my engineer is building this is like he wants to do that so bad. I'm like, let's, let's not worry about it. Um, get it working. So it does. Uh, the issue is those gas sensors will get up to like 400 degrees Celsius, which just kills your battery. Um, so you're getting like a week or maybe two weeks of life on, on that battery. Um, you can drastically reduce the, you know, you can actually have it sleep, uh, but then some of the, some of, you, you can't totally power it down because some of the uh, gas sensors need like, some of them 24 hours to actually get to full, full uh, heat and, and, and uh, calibration and, and running correctly. Um, uh, let's see. If the therm temperature from the thermostat differs from other sensors in the home, do you reconcile the data to determine a more accurate read? And if so, can you alter the set points? Yeah, so yeah, we can definitely alter the set points. And that's what I was saying. So like, yeah, we're, we're, we want to use these to, to augment what the thermostat sees. Maybe the thermostat's on the north side of the house or in a dark right, in a dark hallway somewhere. Um, so using all these other sensors, we can augment that. And we basically don't let the thermostat control itself, right? All the, all the control comes from the Raspberry Pi in that sense. Oh, oh, track that. Oh, shit, sorry. Um, what of this works without internet connectivity? Everything. Um, so I did want to show you. Um, so I've actually got this running. Let me connect to, so it's in AP mode right now because I haven't configured, if it doesn't have Wi-Fi configuration or Ethernet, it'll go into AP mode. Um, you guys got some good questions, thank you. Um, you know, I don't think I have time to do it, um, but yes, it does. Uh, it actually goes into AP mode and you actually can use it while it's in AP mode. Um, now, in AP mode, it's not gonna discover anything on your local network, obviously, but it will, it'll read everything over the, the USB, uh, or the UART, serial UART stuff. Um, <laughs> what research value? Yeah, so not much. Um, that was part of the kind of the home automation stuff, and I just thought, hey, I'll, I'll display it on my graph because I've got the data. Um, but yeah, that was more looking at like the, the when, I, when I started it, the home automation aspect of it. And since I wrote all this code, I'm like, well, fuck it, ship it, you know, um, let's, let's use it. But yeah, you don't, you, know, you don't have to install that plugin. Um, oh, that's, that is one thing I want to show um, is the configuration. So. You know, besides the nurse configuration, which Justin kind of went over, this is it. You just say device manager at client, register device, LifeX, radio thermostat, Chromecast, media stick, Raven, and your IEQ sensor. That's it. Build your firmware, deploy, you're good to go. Cicada handles all the other, the other, the other stuff. Um, um, Uh, yeah, I'd love to. Um, it's, it's very basic right now, um, but it's basically just listening to the events. So can you talk about the device history and data collection in more detail? Um, it's very basic right now in that it, um, it, it's basically just listening to the event stream of all the different devices. And if you've enabled the histogram collection on that device type, um, it puts it into that, that supervision tree. Um, and then you can call snapshot, you can call reset. Um, like I said, I don't have rolling, like a rolling window histogram, which would be kind of cool. Um, but it does 50th percentile, 75th percentile, 90th percentile, 99th percentile, 99.9 .9 percentile, current value, mean, min, max, 
um, and then just shoots out a big, a big uh, map of that. And then that's shoot it up, pushed up to the cloud. And then in the cloud, I can log whichever one of those values I want, right? InfluxDB gives me the opportunity to, so right now I'm doing it every minute, right? And some devices are pushing me data every six seconds. Some, I only have one data point for a minute. Um, so the history isn't much value. Um, but on the, up in the cloud, I can do whatever I want with that data in a later time. Or on the local UI, I can visualize it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, follow up to it, uh, report those listening to foreign music. Yes, that's a possibility. Um, how many lights? Um, so we can do however many lights your router can support, right? It's a really efficient binary, uh, UDP based binary protocol. Um, so it's really up to your router, right? Um, the processes on, on, the, on the Raspberry Pi are super light. Um, so we can, do, we can do quite a few. Um, I think that's the final question. Good, because it's time. It's time. Sorry, guys. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you all. That was fantastic. Round of applause.